So uh, what I want to talk about is, uh, is the notion of unnatural hazards. We tend to think of hazards as this in terms of natural hazards, but one of the points that I want to make is that hazards may emerge out of nature, but actually the disasters that they create are, are part of society. And this example here shows the earthquake in 1999 in, in Turkey. And, uh, and I'll talk about how it doesn't really matter if you talk about earthquakes, tsunamis, volcanic eruptions, that if you, if you dig into them enough, you'll actually see that uh, um, there's social, economic, political, cultural uh, factors at play. So um, I'm going to start with this quote. In a time of extraordinary human effort to live harmoniously in the natural world, the global death toll from extreme events of nature is increasing. Loss of property from natural hazards is rising in most regions of the earth, and loss of life is continuing or increasing amongst many of the poor nations of the world. There is not a single hazard scientist I know that wouldn't disagree with that statement. And yet, that is the opening lines in the first hazard textbook by Burton, Case and White, The Environment's Hazard in 1978. So it seems to me extraordinary, uh, disgusting really, that in 30 odd years, three decades, we still have this statement here. And yet, we think of the advances that we've got in technology and in science, and yet this is still up. And so that's what I'm interested in. That's what I mean by unnatural hazards. My, uh, my introduction to that was, if you look at a graph like this, you see that this is the, uh, from MDAP, the uh, disaster database by university, Catholic University in Leuven. And what you see, this is the number of disasters reported over time. And some of this is reported. You know, there's increases of people, what they, they class as a disaster. You see there's this gradual increase uh, over time, up the data is up to 2011. So we're, we're getting more and more natural disasters. Um, but the 1980s, the, the, the uh, 1990s was the international decade of natural disaster reduction. So it doesn't really seem that a, a whole decade of where the world's attention, scientific, technological, engineering attention has been applied to disasters has had much effect. There is no change really in the curve of that line. If anything, it's got steeper. And the irony is that we know more about the processes behind hazards than ever before. And, and one of the things is that we know where most of our geohazards are coming. And that's not because we are extremely clever. We are extremely clever, but that's not the reason. The reason is because the Earth puts them by and large in the same places. So this is the map showing the plate boundaries. And these plate boundaries define where we find the bulk of the earthquake energy release, where they find the bulk of volcanic eruptions, where most tsunamis occur, and then the mountainous areas that wrap around here, for example, the Andes are up in the rocks. We find where the landslides and floods are. So, it doesn't really matter if you're talking about tsunamis or earthquakes or volcanic eruptions, because nature puts them in the same place, um, we should expect them in the same place. And yet, why is it then that we haven't been able to nail this idea of, of disasters? If we know where most of the natural events, extreme events of nature are going to be, why can't we seem to forecast and manage them? I'm going to talk about tsunami uh, first of all. This is an image from the Adam Islands in 18, 1809. What we see is it's kind of the first Westerners go there. You see a, a, a local community um, which has built its constructions out of natural materials, like natural materials. It's raised and stilts above the, uh, the ground, suggesting that this is a culture that knows that the, the water, the sea is dangerous and can come rushing in. And, and the people have got a culture that they pass on, a cultural memory of traditions and stories about past events. I put up the Adam Islands because in the 2004 Boxing Day tsunami, the Adamant Islands were devastated by, by that tsunami, and it's that I'm interested in. Because what we don't see now, if you go to those places, we don't see those kind of townships made out of local material. You see that. This is uh, from Kaolak. It's a hotel complex that was devastated after that 2004 Boxing Day earthquake. In fact, this is the third apartment in. There was an apartment here and another apartment here, and then this one, the only reason this wall is, is still there is because it's pointing in the direction of the wave cave. 
And that's kind of the point, is that the tsunami that swept in 100 years ago didn't have this to, to contain. You know, someone said to me at the time when we, we went out there, they said, you know, you imagine a tsunami as this wall of water rushing towards you. But all the way along the front of Kowalak, there's uh, shacks that are built there to supply tourists on the beach with ice cream and, and drinks and things like that. And, uh, and he said, what you've got to imagine in the middle of it is that you are seeing a tsunami of fridges and concrete coming towards you. And that's what they didn't have there 100 years ago. We have changed that. We have made that hazard scale. So what you get instead is you have constructions like this built right by the sea because we want to live by the sea. We want to open our doors to so the sea. The locals live about a mile and one. And when this was destroyed, the manager of this hotel said to me, you know, we're going to rebuild this if you tell people to come back. And he's going to rebuild it here because he wants out of line, but actually he's going to rebuild it there because that's where we want to live. We want to live in the danger zone. So that is a culture of catastrophe that we have created artificially. So my point, really, the thread that will go through all of this, is this notion that, that hazards might emerge from nature, floods, earthquakes, etc. They are natural events, of course they are. But the disasters that they create are not. They emerge from society. Um, one example I want to take you to is 2003 in, uh, in Bam, in Iran. And uh, this is a World Heritage Site, a city for mud brick architecture. I should also point out, this is, this is um, Bam before the devastating earthquake of, of 2003, where it was one of the, the visited city for this kind of crumbling mud architecture, very fragile place. But in Boxer, in Boxer Day 2003, an earthquake struck that changed the citadel and these buildings and essentially kind of turned it into rubble. When I was there a few years later, this was them rebuilding it all, all back up. Um, you can see evidence of the earthquake. There's not much of it because most of it's mud brick houses and class. But here is a modern building and you can see these kind of concrete, reinforced concrete pillars that have actually have been bent and twisted by the seismic waves. You can see them going through here. But the point is that building stayed up. These reinforced steel uh, kind of girders inside them managed to keep that building up. So people walked out of that. As far as I know, no law. The, 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 this building is the, the office that held the, the uh, lawyers. And as far as I know, no lawyers died in the, the Bam earthquake. But it's a different story elsewhere. This is the local hospital. You can see built with mud and brick, and that seismic shaking just caused the whole thing to, to, to fall down. Several hundred people died in those ruins. And of course, it's a, it's a double whammy. You know, you kill very vulnerable people, but at the same time, you destroy the one place that you need to be operating in a disaster zone. And it is a triple whammy, because also killed in there are the doctors and nurses and medical experts who you want to go out and treat the wounded. Now, that decision to build a law office with reinforced concrete, and yet to build a concrete, uh, to build a hospital out of brick that falls down, is a societal one. The interesting thing is just how much settlements are kind of have changed themselves to adapt themselves to the hazard process. This is Bam here. You can see the area of Bam located. It's in the Loop Desert, you know, it's like 50 miles of desert wilderness around it, and you have the little town of Bam. And what's extraordinary about the Bam earthquake is here's the fault line. There it is. It runs right through there. And you, you look at this initially and think, well, what, what bad luck. Here's a town in the middle of the desert, all this wasteland, yet the earthquake hits it a direct strike. But of course it's not that. This really is revealed in this Google image. There's Bam up there and here's this fault going straight towards Bam. And it's this area that draws your eye. You can see greenery in that desert. And the point is this is irrigated land and the irrigation is coming out from this fault line. And that's the point really. The fault is a line of persistent water support. And, and that same water that supplied the irrigation of the Bam date fields that have now become the most economic kind of driver for this area have supplied this, this settlement for, for centuries, for millennia. Because if you're going to build in the desert, you need water. That's your most important ingredient. So what we have is that that city there of Bam, that settlement, has been anchored on that fault line since the start. 
And whereas in the early years it was a settlement of a few thousand, whenever an earthquake ruptured along here, it killed a few tens of people. The difference has been that since the kind of 1950s, when cities really started to swell, is that villages became towns, towns became cities, and suddenly you have a town of Bam with 100,000, 200,000 people. So when an earthquake strikes, as it did in 2003, it can kill maybe 30,000 people. That situation gets replicated a lot in many regions. So we have this as the seismicity of Iran. We see lots and lots of earthquakes across this area. And what we, Baum is located down here, and what we see is that in many of these areas, many of these earthquakes are located on fault lines in this desert where water is, is coming out and settlements are built directly on top. So that we get this notion of the population center has been tethered, been anchored into hazard zones. I want to talk a little bit about other places that are kind of affected by this. This is uh, Istanbul, and what we see here is the tectonic setting for Istanbul. We've got Istanbul is up in the green area there. The main area of Turkey is getting pushed out to the west and spreading into the Aegean along this thing, this fault line up here called the North Anatolian Fault, which is moving slowly, two and a half centimeters a year, but moving in a series of earthquake jumps. And indeed, the situation over the uh, the latter part of the 20th century is extraordinary. What we have is earthquakes starting in this area here. So we're down here in this area called Elzinger. And the earthquake starts in 1939, ruptures all the way along to this area here. Now this graph shows how much displacement there is. And so the earthquake in 1939 ruptures this length. And this talks about how much displacement there is. So this is about, this is about seven, eight meters of slip, horizontal slip. But anyway, that's not the, the important point is that the earthquake ruptures to here in 39 stops. And then there's another earthquake that starts just here in 42. The ruptures along. And this is this one. And then 43, this is this one. And, and then there's one in 44 here. And then it jumps back a little bit, fills in this little gap here in 1951. And then it continues on 1957, 1967. And by 1967, it's gone from the eastern part of the North Atoli, right almost western limit in the Marmara Sea, right on the edge of Istanbul. And this is kind of shown really in this set of graphs. Where we, what we see in each of these is the, the purple areas is where the stress has been released, it's relaxed. So that built up stress of the plates has had its earthquake and then it's gone. The crucial areas, the areas have gone red. In those red areas, stress has increased. And what you see is you see progressively the North Anatolian unzipping itself, getting less stressed, but ahead of it, moving ahead, marching ahead, a red zone of increased stress. So here's the increased stress after 39 there, that triggers the earthquake of 42, which then triggers the earthquake of 43, which triggers the earthquake of 44, and etc. etc. So that by 1967, this is the area of red stress. And that precisely is the area that has the earthquake in 1999 that I showed right at the start. Here it is, and this is the stress after August 1999. Oh, actually, there's two earthquakes. It went back and filled this area, and it's got this area of red stress here. And this is significant because this is the Marmara Sea, and that is Istanbul, and that is a city of, depends how you calculate it, 10, 11, 12 million people. And so what seismologists think is that what this is telling us, the science is telling us, is that this city is ready for a big earthquake. It's the only section, this section here, is the only section of that whole plate boundary system virtually that has not experienced an earthquake in the 20th century. Now, if we know anything about earthquake behavior in faults, that fault line there, it's called the Prince's Island Fault, will rupture. And that the implications for that are not minor. The point is that just alongside it, it's not a city of 10,000 or 50,000 or 100,000, a multi-million city. So now what we get is we get this suggestion that when the next one goes in here, we could have a colossal catastrophe on our hands. Um, and that is a city. Um, the thing is about this city, beautiful, beautiful city, this is Hagia Sophia. And this has been occupied for 
it's our longest continuous record of an uh, occupied city in this area and we know it's been affected many times by earthquakes. In fact, if you look at Hagia Sophia, many people think it's rather ugly, it's very blocky. But that's because of these concrete buttresses that actually are located all the way around. You know, that's actually more like a pyramid than any other structure. And it's that that's holding it together. So this city, the city architecture knows it experiences earthquakes. The question is, what about all these? Is that a city that's ready for an earthquake? So that you have this situation where the science can tell you something's coming and you can start to engineer certain things. You can engineer your bridges. And how do you prepare people's minds for it? How do you prepare all these hundreds and hundreds of thousands of buildings that are not ready for it because some of them are quite modern. They've never had a real big thing. So one of the things is we get into this idea of the mega hazard. And there's a temptation to think that mega hazards come from ginormous events, from super volcanic eruptions and mega tsunamis, but it doesn't. It comes from average to normal size earthquakes hitting a big target. This is Japan, metropolitan Japan, the Tokyo area. There's something like 80 million across this region. And this area is waiting for a repeat of the 1923 earthquake. And if you just run a repeat of an earthquake under 1923 into this modern one, you get a colossal damage toll and an absolutely terrifying human death toll. And that's the problem, is that the science takes us to places where we can save it. But what do we do about it? What do you do about a mega city waiting for a disaster? That is really interesting. So, one of the points that I think that hazard science has to confront is how do we go from the science, which is telling us about where the faults are, where the earthquakes are, etc., to what we're actually going to do about it. And many of the things that we concentrate on is the scientific, technological, engineering aspects of it. But actually, I think more importantly is going to be those issues to do with uh, society. This is an image from, uh, from China in the uh, Sichuan earthquake a few years ago, 2008. And it's a primary school that was collapsed and destroyed several hundred school kids killed in that building and yet that office block is perfect and this office block is perfect and this is you see in different parts of the world different countries that we can build office blocks to withstand earthquakes but we choose not to build primary schools and hospitals to withstand earthquakes and that is a societal choice it's not a the earthquake that comes through here by and large doesn't discriminate the discrimination happens earlier. It's what we choose to build, how much money we choose, how much quality we choose. These are decisions for civic society. And so in many cases, the hard choices for earthquake scientists is it's sure we could provide information for the science, but actually it's how that science gets used that becomes the most important thing. So I'm just going to finish with this quote from Ken Hewitt, a Canadian geographer who talks about these things. And he says, society rather than nature decides who's most likely to be exposed to dangerous geophysical agents. In fact, I'd put it stronger. Society, rather than nature, decides who's going to be killed by earthquakes and tsunamis and volcanoes. Thank you very much.